This is Moments of the Movement, Civil Rights and Change in America. I'm Lonnie Bunch, founding director of the Smithsonian's National Museum of African American History and Culture. Welcome to Moments of the Movement. For former United States Department of Agriculture official Shirley Sherrod, experiencing the death of her father at the hands of a white farmer while growing up in rural Georgia in the 1960s, forced her to abandon some of her dreams and propelled her commitment to fight for civil rights. This commitment included fighting for the right to vote and working to create new communities in rural areas. Well, I, as you know, grew up in, in Baker County, Georgia. Um, I grew up in an area where um, the family, our family, my grandmother's family, had located sometime either before or after the Civil War. But uh, I picked them up in the county in the census report um, for 1870. And at that time, they were sharecropping. Um, they eventually, and I'm sure that was their purpose, started buying land. And they worked together as a family to do that. So my grandmother had about 12 or 13 sisters and brothers. And um, she ended up having actually 14 children. So the area, she, her maiden name was Hawkins. And they actually called the area that I grew up in Hawkinstown. And um, as I said, we were farmers. Um, my grandmother and her husband Julius Miller um, were given, I think it was 31 acres by her father. And um, they farmed and continued to buy more land so that by the time they passed on, they were able to give each of their children um, a minimum of 31 acres each. I have four sisters and one brother. <laughs> And the brother, of course, is the youngest. <laughs> I'm the oldest mm -hmm. of the group. Um, there were five girls growing up, and you know, any man, I guess, especially a farmer, wanted a son. And during those years of growing up, um, my father gave all of us boys nicknames. I was Bill, you know, so he. <laughs> He'd, we'd be around on the farm working, and he's, you know, Bill, and he and my mother would have another child, and it's another girl. And um, finally, um, during my senior year of high school, my mother kept getting sick. I didn't know what was wrong. And finally, at school one day, uh, my best friend asked, she said, how's your mom? I said, she doesn't seem to be getting any better. She said, girl, your daddy was at the store yesterday giving out cigars. Your mama's gonna have a baby. He had convinced my mother, try one more time, just one more time for the son. And um, of course, he didn't live to see him. He was born two months after he was murdered. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up around family, um, working on the farm, that was the early life in, in Hawkinstown. And of course, we lived in a county, Baker County had a particularly um, bad reputation in the area. Now, we learned later on during the Civil Rights Movement that each sheriff tried to make people in the county feel that it was worse somewhere else. But I think Baker County probably stood out even more than the others because of the sheriffs that, uh, that we had in the area. So. During my lifetime, it was uh, L. Warren Johnson, who uh, was known as the Gator. And um, the Gator had something to say and something to do with everything that happened in, uh, in Baker County. And he had the county so tight, he had a speed trap set up where you just couldn't ride through uh, without being stopped on the road, and if you were white, you knew you had to pay. Um, if you were black, you had to pay, but you could also lose your life in the process. So it was, a, it was at a time in our lives when he was, my father seemed to be really, really happy. My mother was pregnant. 
and he told everyone it was the boy. He, in fact, he gave out cigars. That's how my best friend observed it and could tell me that, you know, my mother was pregnant because he was giving out cigars to everyone saying, this is it this time, <laughs> you know, this is the boy. He was having a new home built and having a room built specifically for the boy in the new home. I was graduating from high school later, you know, at the end of that school term, and he was happy about that because now the oldest would be going away to college, and things were going well on the farm. Um, he was really, really looking forward to the future. He and this farmer, Cal Hall, had actually done a few things together with goats. I was told that in 63, some of Cal Hall's cows had gotten into our pasture. And when they came to round them up, there was one they couldn't, they just couldn't get him out. So he left him there. Um, I do know that my father was talking to people in SNCC about the civil rights movement coming into Baker County. I don't know whether that was, had something to do with what, what happened later or not. But um, on, the, on the morning of March 14th, which was a Sunday, um, I was driving the car. We were on our way to church and met Cal Hall on the road. And so I stopped, he stopped. Um, my father was in the passenger seat, so he leaned over. Cal Hall said he wanted to come and get the cow. My father told him, if you come back tomorrow, then I get some additional help and uh, meet you around at the pasture. So we went on to church, and, and that's exactly what happened the next day. My father took the man he had uh, working on the farm with him. My mother's brother went there, and then Cal Hall, who was white, brought a black man who worked with him. But instead of his cow, he was trying to claim several, five or six cows in the pasture, and according to the others there, my father told him, no, those, you know, they argued back and forth about the cows, and my father finally said, I don't have to continue arguing with you about it, we just go to court. And they, according to them, he was walking to his truck, and, um, you know, he turned around to say something, that's when he was shot. My father didn't die immediately. He lingered for 10 days before he died. So he died on March 25th of um, 1965. The grand jury, the all white, white grand jury in Baker County refused to indict him for murder. So he was never punished. Now we later tried to sue him. And um, so interesting, I was reading, um, some notes, um, one of the white students we had working with us that summer in Baker County kept a diary and just found it and published his book this year. So he had a, a first-hand accounting of what happened in that courtroom when, um, during the, the trial, uh, the civil trial we had against him. Um, C.B. King, who was the only, he was our attorney throughout the movement, uh, here in Baker County would question potential jurors and ask them if you know of any black people who tell the truth. They, they'd never heard that Negroes, they'd say things about Negroes not telling the truth. And, um, and so each time CB would ask that the judge strike that potential juror and the judge would seat them. And it happened in every case. Uh, CB would drill them, um, but you know, they were all seated, and of course, the verdict that we assumed they would come in with was what they came in with. Well, on the night of my father's death, um, see, I had not shared with my family that I really didn't intend to live in the South. I knew that they would have been against that. Um, so I was secretly planning that in my in my own head, knowing that I didn't intend to live life here, you know. Um, but on the night of his death, um, as our house filled with people who were coming for support, 
um, I just felt as the oldest, I had to do something. I just had to do something um, as a result of what happened. So I actually went in away from everyone into one of the rooms and and I can remember that night um, it looked like the moon was full because I was sitting there looking out the window praying to God asking for an answer I, I just had to do something and and suddenly it just came into my head that you can you can give up your dream of living in the north you can stay in the South and devote your life to working for change. And I can remember once that came to me, I just felt such a calmness. Now, I didn't know how I would go about doing it. We were, we were not active in the Civil Rights Movement at that time because the movement had not started in Baker County. But um, just coming to that conclusion made me feel like I could go on because I had a game plan. Um, and it didn't become clear to me how I could, could do that, how I could carry out that commitment until I was in my first mass meeting. Uh -huh. And it was during my first mass meeting when I saw people who had every right to be afraid, people who were living on Itchaway Plantation, Pineland Plantation, and on the farms, other farms owned by white people in the area, not being afraid, you know. The strength we gathered from each other, being in, in those meetings and planning and, and deciding to fight together. Once I saw that, I knew that this was a way I could fight back. Oral histories were conducted by the Southern Oral History Program and the Center for the Study of the American South at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill on behalf of the Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture and the Library of Congress. Moments of the Movement, Civil Rights, and Change in America comes to you from new visions, new voices, expanding the American conversation because it's time to hear the difference. With support from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, visit us online at newvisionsnewvoices.org.